Truth Espresso, episode 65. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> and now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hello, this is Daniel Minnick, your host for Truth Espresso. Welcome to an exciting episode where I am excited about this opportunity. This is actually uh, the fourth guest appearance on Truth Espresso, and so I think we have uh, some good topics to talk about. And my guest for this episode of Truth Espresso is Jamal Bandy. Jamal Bandy is the host of the Prescribed Truth podcast, and he has a lot to say about current political and cultural issues, and he has a wonderful gospel testimony about how he came out of um, a Christian cult to the truth. And so, Jamal, welcome to Truth Espresso. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Jamal, would you like to just um, brief us a little bit about yourself and um, how you started your podcast, so some of your gospel testimony and what you do as far as ministry and your podcast? Sure. So, um, I'm a husband and a father, two boys, and um, man, the story about the cult um, is an interesting one. Um, you know, I, I grew up in church, you know, didn't know the, didn't know the truth of the gospel, those things. I um, I stopped going to church when I was young and found myself back in church. And unfortunately, it was uh, it turned out to be a cult. And um, I was under that teaching for about a year and a half until the pastor died and the church split. And uh, when that happened, I questioned Christianity, whether or not it was true. And by God's grace, it led me to basically reading the Bible and figuring out what the Bible actually says and comparing that to what I was taught. And that started my journey into truth. <laughs> and uh, from there... A few years later, the Lord would actually save me by, as I believe, through the preaching of the gospel, um, I come to grips with my own sin and uh, my need of a Savior. And from there, I just had a hunger and a thirst for just sharing what the truth is and uh, refuting a lot of the lies based on what I was taught. You know, that's kind of how Prescribed Truth had its start. And so uh, Prescribed Truth I started in 2017. I mean, the Lord saved me in 2013. And um, I started on YouTube and just dealing with doctrinal errors from things I was taught in the past. And it's kind of grown from there. And uh, I was able to start a podcast uh, last year and um, just been dealing with different topics. And here lately, been focusing a lot, a lot on the critical theory and social justice issues that we're facing. Yeah, that's great. Jamal, could you tell us exactly what was this cult that you came out of and what was wrong with uh, what they taught? And were there any particular passages of scripture that caused you to start questioning this cult? Well, unfortunately, I didn't start questioning the cult really until towards the end. But this was a uh, reason why I call it a cult is because the pastor, basically he used manipulation and scare tactics in order to control his congregation. A lot of us who was in the church, we didn't know much about the Bible. We were young, and we didn't read the Bible for ourselves. And so he basically used that to his advantage and we kind of followed him at his word. Uh, he called himself an apostle. He claimed that he had powers given to him from God, and he hears from God. Sometimes he would claim he would have dreams, and he'd know what we were doing, but really somebody was basically telling him. <laughs> <laughs> but he would claim those things, and we would fall for it. And, you know, and so it was based on manipulation and all those things, and Man, I, I used, back then I used to love the book of Acts because they basically just sent around the gifts, signed gifts, you know. That's what our main focus was. And so it wasn't until after he had passed away where I began to read the Bible. And um, a scripture stuck out to me in Proverbs to talk about basically putting our trust in men and how we should not put our trust in man, but putting our trust in the Lord. And that stuck out to me because we trusted him. You know, we put all of our trust in him and what he said and, and all those things. That's kind of what started the tearing down of the walls. He used to twist a lot of scripture, the scripture where Jesus sat with his disciples and um, his mother Mary and his brother well, called out for him. And Jesus said, who are my mother, my brother, but them that do the will of the Lord. But he would twist that because a lot of our families didn't agree with us being in that church. 
but he claimed it well who are they because they're not following the lord they're not in the lord so who are they like this church this body we are true family and so he would twist scriptures like that but later on it started getting real down with drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff um it was wild um i, I do discuss it more on my channel if anybody's interested on my uh, prescribed truth youtube channel there is a uh a three-part series called Why Prescribe Truth, and I go kind of more in detail as far as what took place um, in the cult, if anybody's interested in the sense of the full story. That's pretty uh, cool how God worked there, Jamal. So you said that um, your pastor called himself an apostle. I think we both agree that there is no office of apostle right now. So who would call himself an apostle? Is this some form of like a Pentecostal group? Yeah, Pentecostal and apostolic groups, uh, they seem to believe that the title of an apostle is basically set on those who started churches. Well, at least that's what my pastor was saying. He said because he founded this church like Paul founded churches, right? <laughs> and established churches and because he's the founder of this church, this is like an apostolic anointing. And it, he, they would say stuff like the uh, apostles operate in all five of the uh, apostolic gifts or the, the gifts basically from Ephesians 4, it talks about how God gave some pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and apostles for the building up of the church. Well, they say an apostle operates in all five. They can be a prophet, you know, they can be the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, and so on and so forth. They believe they was prophesying and, and God spoke through to him. My pastor, he used to actually say that we were the closest thing to the voice of God that we would hear. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so when... Your pastor is someone who claims to be an apostle. Really, you know, how do you question him? Because, yeah, if he claims to speak for God, he's, you know, he's delivering the modern day word of God to you, basically by a form of direct revelation. Like, how can his views be challenged? That that does seem like the, the one of the marks of a cult. And, you know, it does seem like that would keep the members under bondage because they don't have any means by which to try the spirits and to test what the pastor is teaching if it's true right we didn't and we didn't challenge and for those of us that kind of ch that challenged him at all he would rebuke us like publicly and like harshly he spent his time emasculating the men especially in front of their wives the children and then you know that made him like the alpha male you know um, at the time i was young I, I wasn't married at the time of course you know but i see how he treated other married men you know, in front of their wives and belittle them when they challenge them in, in any kind of way. And we were like a, a gang slash, you know, a gang in this cult. It's like, so we stood up for him. So if anybody opposed him, we would stand up for, for him. And um, if people from the outside talk bad about him, we would step up for him, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it was bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so when it comes to like that kind of cultic thinking, I think it's pretty common because you have so much trust invested in your teacher, your guardian, your protector, that you have such a loyalty to them. And so then that's kind of the tragedy of it, that you'll go to the mat to defend this you know, leader to the death. But then for a lot of people, unfortunately, when one they realize that what they're being taught is not the truth, then they can just become the religiously abused. And, you know, as you, I think you said before, it's like some people they, who come out of these things, they just become the religiously abused. They just become atheists. But thank God for his grace that he could take you out of the imitation and lead you into the truth without abandoning God and his word in the process. Hey man, it was. I tell you, this one thing he 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 said, and I remember when he when he died. He died in a van accident um, here. Um, he was on the way out of town to a church event. You know, he was going to be preaching at. And while he him and a few uh, uh, about twenty, uh, you know, was about a total of nineteen people, including him, um, headed out of town. The tire flew and the van flew. Four people passed away, including him. And I remember he used to prophesy and say that like he had died and God brought him back to life and that he's always prophesied like, you know, this, he'll prophesy something and he'll say, well, if it don't happen, I won't preach no more as if like, as in God's going to take him away. Right. <laughs> but then he would say stuff like God is not going to kill him. Like God told him like, Hey, I'm, it's not your time. You're not going yet until A, B and C happens. And so when he passed away, it was such a like, well, wait a minute, like this ain't supposed to happen, you know? 
And um, I remember going on the road, hitting the road. After I found out about it, we hit the road to go to the hospitals where some of the people were who were injured. And one of the guys I was riding with, he was in a car with me. He was like, Jamal, he's like, what are we going to do? Like, he's not supposed to die. Like, but he's dead. Like, what does this mean? He's like freaking out, you know? And by this time, I was already kind of like, kind of snapping out of it all. But it was like, man, like, it just wasn't true, you know? And I, and I think as uh, by God's grace, what hit me as far as realizing that I shouldn't give up on Christianity as a faith was because the man taught from the Bible, but we didn't know the Bible ourselves. It just came to be honest with myself. I didn't know the Bible like that. I didn't read it like that. I, like I said, I stayed in the book of Acts. I didn't read Proverbs. I didn't read the Psalms. I didn't read what the Bible says about false teachers, or false prophets, and not to fear them when it doesn't come to pass, like any of those things. And so as I began to read the Bible, it was like, yo, if I would have read the scriptures, maybe I wouldn't have believed in them so much. But I hung on what he taught, and I was, you know, didn't didn't read for myself. And that's the case of a lot of people who find themselves in these cults. They don't know the scriptures for themselves. Yeah, amen. It's like, well, what what do you need more than the book of Acts? I mean, you have the the <laughs> you have the lessons of Jesus applied. You have the the example of the early church. You have some of the sermons that were being preached. So why do you need anything else? But <laughs> so Jamal with with this um, apostolic group, were they oneness by any chance? Like, did they teach a oneness doctrine of God? Yeah, he did. He, he didn't label himself as a oneness, but um, I remember him talking about um, the nature of God one time, and he spoke of Jesus basically being in multiple forms, existing as the Father in the past, and um, came as a Son in the present, and then now exists as the Holy Spirit. Wow, so, so basically he taught a form of uh, modalism. So then how did he deal with the passages where Jesus would pray to the Father? Was Jesus praying to himself, or how did he explain that? He would say that Jesus was basically, every time he prayed to the Father, he was basically just giving an example of how prayer should be, but really praying to him, basically just being an example, not really praying to anyone, just basically showing an example of how important prayer is. And I remember one time he covered, I remember taking notes on it. I still have that. I still have those notes to this day. He told us that in the beginning, in Genesis, where you have God created man and woman, and said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He said that the hour there included Satan. He said, that's why, that's why we have good and bad in us, because we were made in the image of God and Satan. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I never heard that one before. I mean, I've heard oneness people explain Genesis 126 and the the plural as being either God speaking to the angels and saying, hey, le- let's make kind of like a, hey, guys, let's check out what I'm going to make. <laughs> or that, you know, that the plural there is the royal we. So God refers to himself with the royal we. So those right. are two explanations I heard, but not that the reason we do good and bad is that we're created in the image of God and Satan. That's a new one yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. That was, I mean, I remember taking notes on it. And I remember after, uh, before the Lord saved me, actually, I remember reading through Genesis and looking at that and I realized, well, that's not true. And I, you know, looking at it again, I was like, that can't be, you know, and so I remember, I remember making a note by it saying, this is not talking about Satan, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but it, I, as, as if updating my notes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I still didn't, I still didn't understand the Trinity at the time. I was still um, a modalist at the time, but I knew that that explanation didn't fit. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like, yeah, obviously Satan's not mentioned there by name. You you have to read that in, and then plus everywhere else that said that we're created in the image of God, it never mentions Satan. It's just the image of God, <laughs> but, right? It's interesting. So then some passages, for example, because I've talked with several oneness people, especially in online venues, and sometimes I've had some pretty interesting discussions with them. So one passage, for example, if especially given what you were taught, like kind of a dynamic monarchianism or like, uh, um, yeah, like a strict original Sabellian modalism <laughs> that mm-hmm. God was just in three different forms, you know, past, present, future, and that Jesus was actually just setting an example when he prayed. He wasn't actually praying to anyone, but it's interesting if you look at John 8, 
17 through 18, where Jesus appeals to the law. Now, if Jesus, of course, is God and he gave the law and he's born of a woman born under the law, according to Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Jesus said in John 18, verses 17 through 18, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And so Jesus is saying that his testimony is confirmed as true because according to the law, there are two witnesses, and that the Father and he both bear witness to the truth. And so if right. <laughs> if there, God is only the one person and Jesus is the manifestation of the Father, then how can the Father and Son be separate witnesses according to the law. Oh man, you just haven't been you just haven't been baptized with the gift of the Holy Spirit <laughs> yeah. speaking in tongues. Yeah, so yeah. The, <laughs> because I haven't had the gift of tongues, I prove I haven't have the Holy Spirit, and therefore any reading of the Bible, any interpretation of it is invalid. And of course I haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus only, but <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty interesting, you know, of course, even John 17, uh, verse 3, or John 17, 5, where, let me find it here, um, Jesus is praying to the Father, not to himself, but he says, and now, O Father, glorify me with, with your own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so Jesus is clearly saying that he and the Father both pre-existed um, his conception before the world was, and that he had this glory with the Father. And so that's pretty interesting. It points out that Father and Son both exist together, and that they both existed prior to the Incarnation, which, of course, would parallel what John 1, 1 shows, that the Amen. that um, the Logos was proston theon, you know, face-to-face -face with the Father. Amen. I mean, it's, it's so clear when you read it, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, you, it, you can't get any clearer than that. It's, it's plainly there. Yeah. Right? Some, somehow they found a way to tap dance around it. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I know with, like, the converse, I don't know what conversations you've had maybe with your or your oneness friends or other oneness people, like, on the Internet, but I, I don't know if we're, when you were in the apostolic oneness cult, did, was there any mentions of Dr. David Bernard? No. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't know about any theological figures until after I was brought by the gospel. Uh, it was interesting because, you know, back when I was coming up in, that, in those kind of teachings, he taught, it was like, uh, he talked down about those who studied. Mm. You know, like anybody who had a theological degree and all those things, like that was like ridicule because they didn't, they didn't truly have the spirit because they had to go to school, you know, because it's the spirit who teaches us all things and they went to school. Mm. So like, I didn't know about anybody in that, in those, in those arenas. So this this was definitely a an apostolic cult. It wasn't even mainstream oneness Pentecostalism like the UPC. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So at least the oneness people that I encountered seem to be familiar with Dr. David Bernard, who seems to be the scholar who wrote a book called The Oneness of God, and he basically formulated the oneness teaching, kind of the official modern oneness teaching of the uh, United Pentecostal Church International, the U UPCI. And interestingly, oneness historically has been Sabellian modalism. And of course, oneness now is still modalism, but mainstream oneness teaching seems to have adopted kind of uh, Nestorian leanings. I don't know if you've heard of Nestorianism from uh, church history, the early uh, 5th century teaching, basically that yeah. the son was kind of almost like two persons. And so like the son had a human person and a divine person. So not, not that the son is one person with two natures as Orthodox Christianity teaches the hypostatic union, but mm -hmm. really that, it seems like all false teaching refuses to acknowledge the category distinction between being or nature and person. And right. so it's always like a person and a, or equals a nature. And so 
with Nestorianism now, historically speaking, Nestorius himself may not have been a Nestorian, but, you know, that's a discussion for another time. But Nestorian teaching, uh, it makes Jesus kind of schizophrenic in that he has a human person and a divine person that kind of cooperate together on the basis of a shared will. And so, you know, the human person can almost communicate with the divine person. And so in order to maintain modalism, the modern oneness teaching is that the father indwells the son. The son is just the human being of Jesus. And then the father, which is God, indwelled the son like when I've had conversations with oneness people online, I'd ask them the question to explain the incarnation. Do yeah. they even believe in an incarnation? And usually they say, well, of course I do. So I'd ask them questions about what is an incarnation and is the son the father and who, to whom and does he pray to the father? Is the father a separate person? And by the time I'm done asking the questions, they seem to come to grips with the fact that they they hadn't thought through what they're really proposing and that they don't really support an incarnation doctrine. It's really possession that God possesses yep. a separate human being. And, and right. so then I ask the question, well, then what's the difference between Jesus and us if the Holy Spirit is Jesus, which is the Father, and the Holy Spirit indwells us at salvation, then aren't couldn't we say that we are also the incarnation of God? <laughs> and then the, right. and a lot right. of them don't know what to do with that, but really they don't believe in incarnation, which would be taking on a nature because they believe in possession, which really the Father just indwelt a human being with his own personhood. <laughs> And so you totally lose wow, the doctrine man. of the incarnation with oneness theology. It's a, it's a pretty interesting discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wasn't familiar with the, the term, but um, there was a time, not, not in the cult that I was in, but afterwards, the church I joined after that was still like, uh, still like a Pentecostal type church. And, um, and they did preach that, you know, that basically like Jesus was basically possessed by God, you know, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I did have that teaching later on. Yeah. Because it's interesting, on one side, they'll say that Jesus is God. On the other side, they'll say that Jesus is just the human being and dwelt by God. And so, yeah, like, depending on the question it ask, it's like one or the other, but it, you know, it can't be both. <laughs> but, yeah. Right. It's pretty interesting. So, Jamal, is the, to kind of start to get into some political topics or basically the kind of the critical theory and the racial topics going on, especially in this crazy year of 2020, just touching up the oneness and apostolic teaching, is there like a representation of different ethnicities there more so than, say, like mainstream Orthodox Christian denominations? Or are they about the same? Well, I guess it depends on where you are. Um, and, and in my particular church, you know, we was predominantly black. Um, every now and again, we have a couple, you know, white people come in, but they would go. Our our, our church back then, man, it was like, <laughs> it, people came in, a lot of people was able to see the foolery before we were, you know, it's, it's like we were, we was hung off the Kool-Aid. And so if, when people come, they would go, they would stick around. Um, but we were predominantly black then. And the church I was in, a couple of churches I was in, I thought were predominantly black. But yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm guessing it just depends on where you are when it comes to stuff like that. Mm. It's that small. Yeah. So it could be like a, a regional distribution or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I think with, I think with us, it, um, a lot of us that was going to this church were kind of, we lived around in the same area. You know, none of us lived um, outside of 15 minutes from each other. Like, so we were all young. I mean, when I say young, I mean, like I was 19 when I joined the church. So and that was uh, that was the average age. <laughs> yeah, that was average age and, and a little younger. You um, know, the oldest member of our church at the time, see, the pastor, he was thirty three, and uh, so the oldest member outside of him was like twenty seven, and he was and he was the elder, quote unquote. Oh well, that's <laughs> but a lot of energy in that church, though. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of energy, a lot yeah. of shouting, a lot of running around, and sweat, and everything else. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, it it sounds kind of like, you know, if it weren't some religious problem, it does sound like kind of fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, I talk about a lot of the bad teachings, but we, it was a lot of times I've had fun with them. We had good times. You know, it wasn't all like we were, you know, sitting around just rocking back and forth, looking idle at the wall. You know, <laughs> like, you know, we would, we would go places and stuff, but it's just like when you look at the overall of it, it's just like, man, like we were just we're gone. You know, a lot of us didn't have money, but, you know, the pastor, he had money because we were basically giving it all. And when you look at the overall of it, it's, it was like, man, like even though we were at times where we could say we had good times, we enjoyed each other's company. It's like when you look at it over underneath all that, it's like sad, you know. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. <laughs> And it's, you know, like I said, it's more, I could more, I could say on that, but it's just, it's just a long drawn out story as far as the actual experience of this particular cult, yeah. you know, and I think, I, and I honestly believe with this particular pastor, and I think it's something to have to be careful of when, when people are um, dealing with cults or maybe in one, sometimes I believe this pastor actually started his church with genuine intentions. I think, you know, he really believed in the apostolic side. He really believed in what he was doing as far as the prophet goes. I don't think he was trying to deceive in the beginning. Um, but I believe he began to see how much leadership he had and how much influence he had on us. And that got the best of him, mm -hmm. you know, over time, yeah. you know, so I just, I think he just it was a downward spiral and the teachings he was under, like, it's interesting when you, when you're under false teachings, like it's, I think it started to crash in on him because his belief system was that we have to do so much good in order to equal out our bad, you know? And I guess he began to realize it towards the end. It's like, man, I'm bad. I can't do nothing about it. I'm so messed up. And he used to preach about it a lot, how jacked up he is and everything else and just like shouting, you know, because he just wanted God to deliver him of, it, of his wickedness, sin, you know. But it's, it's, we're, looking for, we're looking for this supernatural purging, so to speak, like throwing up or uh, laying hands on somebody in order that, for that to happen. When the Bible has always taught us it's the Lord who, who's already taken it on the cross, but it, and it's the Holy Spirit who changes our hearts to hate our sin and to love him and to love righteousness. But in that kind of teaching, you look for somebody to lay hands on you. You look, you look for that, that that feeling of anointing versus the truth that was actually supposed to happen, you know? <laughs> I think that came in on towards the end. Yeah, yeah. Praise God for his grace and bringing you out of that. But he didn't just bring you out of that. He brought you into, you know, like a um, conservative, um, reformed faith. And that's kind of in low supply in this country. You know, you're not like a, what sometimes what people would call an even jellyfish or, even, you know, <laughs> something like that. You know, it's like, you know, like. Uh, well, that was crazy because he, I, I bought into, I didn't say, I, I say bought into, but I subscribe to Reformed theology because as the Lord was bringing me into the, into truth, I began to see things in scripture that I didn't, I had no idea it was quote unquote reformed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, I believe in a workspace belief system, right? And I, you know, and I believe that um, I could lose my salvation. And I remember seeing it, one of the first things I saw in scripture, I think it was around 2012 or 13. Um, I looked at scripture and I recognized, I think I was reading John 6, and Jesus said that all that the Father has given me, I will by no means cast out. And I was like, wait a minute, he will by no means cast out. He said, but he said the Father gave them to him. And then he goes on to John 10 and talks about how all that comes to me is because the Father draws them. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, wait, wait. I've been taught all this time that basically I made a decision to come to God. And I made a decision to come to him and I can make a decision to leave. But Jesus is saying that there's no way I can go if I'm in him, you know, but it was scary to me. It, it didn't make me feel like I had a license to say, like some people try to make it seem to me, it, it brought fear mm -hmm. because I'm like, if this is true and that the father is the one who's choosing, then how do I know if I'm truly saved? Like, am I truly in God? You know, I started to really examine my life and, <laughs> and I, had, I, and I'm like, wait a minute. Like, and I, I remember getting excited because I'm like, I'm like, yo, we've been taught that it's our works that save us. But Jesus is saying our works can't even do anything for us. Like, this is already chosen. Mm -hmm. like, this was already done before we even had anything to do with it. Like, before I bought that out, the Father already knows if I'm in him or not. He's already made a decision. And I didn't know that was, where, that was uh, <laughs> you know, reformed theology. I had no idea about total depravity or any of that stuff or perseverance of the saints. I that, but I did see where Jesus says that all the fathers give me, I know I know means cast out, and that I give them eternal life. Like my sheep know my voice, and they and they come to me, you know, and I give them eternal life. And my Father, you, you know, like what Jesus says, uh, John ten says, they're, they're in my hands, and no one can snatch them out of my hands. And my Father, who is greater than all, no one can snatch them out of His hands. And I'm like, 
whoa, I can, that means I can't snatch myself out. <laughs> so what is this belief saying that if I if I go in if I if I'm in God and I start doing this and doing that, then I'm then I'm no longer in God. But Jesus says no one can snatch them out of His hand. That means myself. And so some people will say, oh, some people will say that you're trying to make a license to sin. Or I can just do anything. But what it made me think about was like, man, like this guy loves us so much. Like why he wouldn't let us go? And you think about anybody else in just in a worldly sense. When you recognize somebody loves you that much and willing to do for you and help you when you can't help yourself. Like you don't want to continue to do bad. You want to do good for them. You know, you want to you want to be there for them. You want, you know, so I want to do good. You want to make good on what they've done, you know, and so the love of God makes me want to serve him more. It makes me want to turn away from sin, not to turn towards it, you know? And so that was one of the things I began to see. I remember talking to my, uh, my still oneness friends. I was still sort of oneness, you know, I was, I, I was on the fence at the time. And, uh, but I saw that and I was like, man, like we were taught wrong. I remember going to old friends of mine. I'm like, man, we were taught wrong, man. Like, man, our works don't save us. And I remember seeing that, you know? And um, it was like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, man, I'm just telling you, man, our works don't save us. Like you don't like you don't you don't have to cry out and spit on the floor every time you mess up. Like you just gotta go to Christ. <laughs> and I and I remember that like being something that the Lord just woke woken up to me. And so when I came to when I actually come to understand or hear about reform theology, I'm like, oh well, I already agree with that. <laughs> you know, I can I see it in scripture. I actually I actually saw in Genesis where it talks about when God says that uh, He would no longer destroy the world because of man because man is evil from the day of his uh, youth. And so I saw that. I'm like, wait a minute. So God said he won't know. He won't no longer show the earth with water because of this. Like he basically saying that we've always been bad. Hmm. Like, you know, we've always been jacked up. I didn't know about total depravity, but that stood out to me. You, you get what I'm saying? Yes. And so that was just, just come scriptures that like stood up to me at the time. And what really broke me was when um, the Lord actually brought me to the understanding of the Trinity. And I'm, I'm not going to be too long on it because it's actually a longer story, but it was a beautiful time because I was one this and I remember a friend of mine was asking me about the Trinity and I told him, I said, look, I don't know what the Trinity is. I said, I'll ask some questions to the people I know and I'll get back to you. And I remember going to a oneness guy <laughs> and I didn't know he was oneness, but I was like, Hey man, I was like, what is it? What is the Trinity? And he began to give me all these scriptures about how the one, about the oneness of God, you know, God is one. I and the father are one and so on and so forth. Give me all this scripture. And he was saying, the, you know, God is not a monster. He's not a three headed monster, you know, so basically he was saying there was no Trinity. And I, I mean, I, I, look, I wrote all the scriptures down he gave me, but I wasn't satisfied because he didn't really help me understand what the Trinity is. Like, what, is, what do people say the Trinity is? Because that's what I want to figure out. And that's kind of how I do, how I deal with things now. It's like, when I don't know something, I don't want to know the opposing. I want to know what the, the people who ascribe to it say it is. And then and let's see if the Bible agrees with it. And so I remember going back home and then I turned on YouTube and I look up Trinity and what popped up was James White's Forgotten Trinity. <laughs> mm, yeah. And I remember watching that and watching him break that down. I watched Jeff Durbin's video on the Trinity. And, uh, and I remember following them in the notes and I'm looking to refute them. I'm like, they can't be right. You know, because I've been looking at these scriptures all this time. And I'm like, they can't be right. But as I follow what they were saying, and I, I, I don't, man, as I follow what they were saying, and just looking at the scriptures, and when they're talking about the underlying words and everything else, it opened up and my, I mean, the scales were off. I remember, I remember crying mm -hmm. when I come to that understanding, <laughs> I was crying. I remember uh, calling a friend of mine, I was like, the, tri the Trinity is true. Like, <laughs> God, is, God is the Trinity. You know what this means? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, the, even the understanding of love, how God, it's impossible for God to be love apart from being multi-personal. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go that long, this, but that yeah. was like a turning point in my walking, you know, walking the Lord at that point, just that understanding. Yeah, I, th I think that's really cool because, you know, I grew up always believing the Trinity, but not really having it explained to the best of the ability. And so when I talk with, when I was younger and I talk with other people and you know, they would challenge the Trinity. I didn't really know how to explain it or defend it. But then, yeah, I watched, I read the, the Forgotten Trinity by James White, and I would watch some videos, and he would explain the difference between being and person. And, you know, like, first I'm thinking, like, aren't you just splitting hairs a little bit there? But then it really got me to understand that, like, everything follows everything else, and, like, doctrinally, like, just 
you know, starting from the attributes of God, like you said, God is love and understanding, you know, personal, natural attributes and, you know, the eternal nature of God and then going from the Trinity to who Jesus is, the incarnation. And it's like, oh, a category distinction between being and person, the who and the what is necessary to understand who Jesus is, the incarnation, where God is one nature, three persons. There's one God, but three persons. And then from there, the one person of the Son takes on the human nature. So he's one person with two natures. And then instead of thinking that that's like weird and confusing, it's actually such a beautiful thing because you can't have an, a true incarnation. You can't even define the incarnation without that, without the Trinity and the distinction in personhood between the Son and the Father. And then like to understand, well, why the incarnation because he has to be our substitute so you go from the doctrine of god the attributes of god to the the nature of god trinity to who is jesus the incarnation to substitutionary atonement and it's all linked together and you know if you get rid of the trinity you don't have any of that amen amen it's yeah it's pretty it's pretty cool and So, Jamal, before we end this episode, I would like to play a promo for your podcast, Prescribed Truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another for his name's sake. What's up, everybody? I'm Jamal Bandy, the host of the Prescribed Truth Podcast, where I seek to distribute the truth that the doctor prescribes to the church and the world today. The Lord graciously brought me out of a cult in 2010, saved me in 2013, and in 2017, Prescribed Truth began. My mission has been to spread the truth of God's word while refuting dangerous lies affecting most churches and the culture at large from a biblical and reformed perspective. Join me on Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time for the live recording of the podcast on YouTube and download the audio version wherever podcasts can be found, including the Christian podcast community. If you would like to know more about Prescribed Truth, please visit my website at prescribedtruth.com. And remember, this world is full of errors, but the only thing that the doctor prescribes is truth. Blessings. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso. 